So, so I have a 13-year-old son, and uh, he's about to be 14 next month. And a few weeks ago, I had the sex conversation with him, which uh. was which was interesting. Huh. Even though I knew he had already knew about sex, he was taught like the sex education in school. And they have friends; they all they do like the shit, right? But I just I wanted to make it an official conversation. I sat him down at the table. I said, "Listen, son, I just I went through the basics, you know." This is the penis. Well, you know, if you, you got one. <laughs> Focus. You gotta have that confidence, right? You gotta be like, yo, I'm fucking better than everybody. I will fucking smash everybody. Have a crippling insecurity, a fear of not being good at all, of being shit. And that fear drives. Hello and welcome to Only The Real. I'm your host, Tony Kyle, and today we are in the beautiful Marbella with none other than my good brother, Sterling Cooper. How are you doing, bro? Sterling Cooper, I'm, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> I'm talking to the camera. <laughs> Sterling Cooper is the world's number one men's intimacy coach. He has products, info products, ranging from how to... Um, sed- <laughs> what the fuck? Go and tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you tell the people. I actually have the whole, I actually have the whole list. Uh, let me see. What do we got? How to actually grow your penis. Sexual dominance escalation. Preventing premature ejaculation. Dirty Talk 101. Supplements. Fire and wood. And you added two more. Starting bold. Yep. Okay. Yep. So he's an all-around uh, top-notch entrepreneur. Uh, he's, he's an all-around great guy. And he has a lot of wisdom to share, especially when it comes to women, relationships, uh, I've learned a lot just from, from knowing this guy for a few years, and uh, today I hope that you guys get to uh, get, gain some of this guy's, this guy's wisdom. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for, thanks for being here, brother. Thanks for coming here. Of course, of yeah. course. So first of all, you, get to, you live here. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? So yeah, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> so like, you, you get to come outside every day, and you get to look at this beautiful view, man. Like, I get to look at that mountain right there, which I have climbed twice. Seriously? Twice. It, the first time it was a 10 hour, it's six hours up, four hours down. Second time, went up the, went up the very steep side, it was six hours up, two hours down. <laughs> Sucked. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like you enjoyed it though. Mate, the view from the top of that is unbelievable. It's worth it. Yeah, okay. and especially when, when I did it, there was actually clouds up there. So I'm in the clouds, like passing through the clouds, yeah, walking that, along the top, it's great. Uh, yeah, Sp- Spain, especially Marbella, one thing I noticed when I first came here is like, it reminds me a lot of California. I'm sure yeah, you've been to California, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. It has women, weed, and weather. <laughs> yeah. Except <laughs> California's a little bit more degenerate than here. Slightly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, Marbella's a little degenerate too, though. Yeah, um, I think Marbella's a bit safer. 100%. Than California, despite the fact that there actually are quite a lot of drug dealers here. There are, but I feel like but the they're drug the, dealers... But they're the top ones. Yeah. So, like, no one fucks around. Right, I feel like the drug dealers here are more professional. Like, yeah. they, they run a, a business. Yeah, and the, and and they're all they're all here to have like to relax and holiday. So they're not they're not really up in each other's beef. Yeah. Here. And you don't get like petty crime and and you know petty theft here because you could be stealing from a, a kingpin. <laughs> so you, no one really wants to fuck around. Exactly. Yeah. It's I kind of like that. It's 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 safe, not because of like policies and governments and it's safe because of the people that live here. <laughs> it's That's inter- the best kind of safe. It's a very interesting yeah. dynamic, yeah. Yeah. Um, so how long have you been here? This will be two years. Two years. Are you plan yeah. on moving anytime soon? I don't know. I don't know if I'll stay another year. We'll see. I actually have I've been thinking about going back to the US. Um, getting myself a little back to the US. Yeah, getting myself getting my, getting myself a homestead, getting myself a, a farm. Really? Where? Yeah, really. Probably Tennessee. I'm looking at Tennessee or Utah. Okay. Are two places I'm looking at. Utah's beautiful. I've heard very, very good things about Utah um, from my friend Justin. Actually, yeah. he, he raves about it. Actually, I'm not supposed to. I'm not supposed to mention Utah. I didn't say that because uh, it's a little. He says it's a little hidden paradise that no one knows about yet. Yeah. So don't go to Utah. Uh, <laughs> no, go my... anywhere. Go to California. <laughs> San Francisco, to be exact. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, so my, my father was a truck driver, and uh, so when I was really young, about eight all the way to like thirteen, he used to take me on long trips across the, the U.S. So very young, I got exposed to like the beauty and the ugliness of the U.S. Yeah. Um, very early, and, I, and I, it was very interesting. It was, it, was, it was enlightening for, you know, a young lad such as myself to get to see, like, so many different environments, you know? I never knew that America is one of those countries that you could get 
everything in the, in that country. If, yes. you, if you want fucking Miami uh, weather with women, you go there for that for that vibe. You want buildings in New York and craziness, you go there for that vibe. And then you go to the Midwest and chill out. So like you said, I, I just took a trip to uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Wow, that's that's probably on par with how beautiful Utah is, because this is where all the billionaires from San Francisco they have their vacation homes in, in Jackson Hole. Ah. Yeah. You know what's a really interesting, I, I'll, I'll send you this map when we're done. Yeah. I just saw a map yesterday of where all the billionaires are buying up like land and properties in the US, superimposed over the hypothetical like uh, flood lines when we have a pole, a, a, the magnetic pole shift. Very interesting. So basically like if the magnetic pole shift, which happened like we're due for that, it happens like every a couple of thousand years or something. Yeah. That's when the last ice age happened, I think, when the magnetic pole uh, shifted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you just get shitloads of stuff being flooded. Really? So, like, all of California is underwater. Like, most of the East Coast is underwater. Like, Florida is definitely underwater. Really? Louisiana is all underwater. Like, and if you superimpose that map over where, like, a lot of the richest people on the planet have bought property, it's very interesting. So they buy where the places are getting flooded? Where, where, they're, flooded? where they're not going to get flooded. Oh. It's almost like they're buying it according to that map. <laughs> okay, I see what you're saying. Huh. They might know something. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, I wanted to, uh, actually, I searched the name on Google, and the first thing that came up was a London-based fashion retailer and wholesaler that was part of yeah. the swinging London scene in the 1960s. Yeah, it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> what is, what's up that with that? that? Well, there was, a, there was a fashion brand called Sterling Cooper back then. But it says a swinging scene. Does that have anything to do with sex? No, that was, that's like the, I think it's referring to the dance. Okay. Back in that particular era. I could have sworn, like, that's yeah. exactly where Sterling stole his name from. Because it's the swinging scene. Sadly not. No, no, no my, the, my name is a lot more boring than that. Yeah. I literally just came up with four random names and then polled every woman I know by text message, like which one's the sexier? Okay. Name. And they all picked Sterling Cooper, so I went with that. That's yeah. actually pretty genius. I mean, <laughs> it'll outsource to the crowd, man. <laughs> like, it's simple. I think it's paid off pretty well for you. It's, it worked, yeah. yeah. It worked. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's just get right into it, bro. Like, I, I really admire your depth of understanding of relationships, women, sex, and oddly enough, chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, just ex explain, like, explain your background and uh, if you want to go through like all of your major fields and also the chemistry as well. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll, we'll go in chronological order, shall we? Sure. I, did, I have a double degree in chemistry with honors uh, from University of Western Australia. I'm actually a pub I was actually a published scientific author before I graduated. So we, I, me and my supervisor, we published a paper before I even graduated, so I've got that little <laughs> accolade to my name. Uh, went from there, did like work in, as a pharmaceutical research chemist for a while, then I switched into oil and gas uh, quality control chemistry for a while. Got sick and tired of doing that. Uh, <laughs> decided I need to get my dick sucked a bit more. And <laughs> pivoted into, uh, actually, actually pivoted into bartending for a bit first, but then I pivoted into, um, yeah, escorting. I did work as a straight male companion in Australia, where well, that is legal. Uh, used to service wealthy businesswomen yeah. on weekends. Used to get flown out to, to New Zealand for skiing trips for the weekend and stuff. That uh, sounds fun, actually. You know, it was embarrassing because I, I didn't know what to charge at that time. I, I thought I charged like a pretty reasonable amount for the weekend for this, this Chinese millionaire who was my client. And she uh, then proceeded to spend twice as much on a pair of earrings while we were there in, in New Zealand. For herself? Yes. Huh. During the course of this trip, I'm like, son of a... Yeah. <laughs> Should have charged a lot more. <laughs> but <laughs> Wait, how, how do you even? I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. How do you even meet those clients? Uh, well, in Australia, they have forums where you can actually advertise that okay, kind of thing. Got it. Yeah, so it's totally legal to advertise the services, and then you'd source clients that way. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, very different, very clandestine in America compared to the way they do it in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So did that for a bit, um, and then kind of got sick of you know, servicing middle-aged women, shall we say. Okay. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I could have a crack at porn. I had some friends in that in the escorting industry, some lady friends who dabbled in it, and they were like, you should give it a try. Here's some, some people to hit up. Did that, did quite well at it. Did well enough at it that I was able to move to America and uh, won an award out there, got nominated for a bunch of awards, worked with every major company you've ever heard of, uh, I mean, worked with every they, major girl you've ever heard give of. Out Awards for pornography? Correct, yeah. So this is like the Grammys of porn? Exactly, yes. It's exactly, <laughs> wow. it's exactly like that, yes. Okay. Yes, with a lot more tits. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> wow, I can only imagine like what one of those conferences is probably like. Uh, they're actually quite a lot of fun. I'm, I'm pretty sure they are. Quite a lot of fun. It's like a big, think of like, 
Think of any um, convention you might have been to. Like yeah. you might have been to a weed convention. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. And you, there's all these booths and everything. But at every booth, there's someone with their tits out. It's kind of like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you got do. This, this is the weird part about the ABNs, for example. Like that's Adult Video Network. That's the biggest one. There's you'll have booths where like you know a particular porn star will be there, scantily clad, and you'll have lines hundred meters long of dudes with their, with that girl's DVD at a magazine that she's on and like they're lining up to get her to sign the DVD they jerk off to. It's quite an interesting dynamic to be exposed to. And as, the, as a dude in that environment, like, no one gives a shit about the dudes. No one <laughs> So cares. nobody never ran up to you like, yo, you're Sterling no, Cooper. No, no, because they don't recognize me. They, they recognize me from the dick down, <laughs> but they don't recognize my face, right? Because right. I'm... I'm not on, my, this is barely on camera. Yeah. And, this, and the parts that it is on camera, they're skipping through <laughs> and going straight to the cock. So they don't recognize me. You, know, you don't really get recognized. Unless you're like Johnny Sins, he gets recognized because he's like memed to all high hell, right? Yeah. But as a dude, you can walk through this environment and like really people watch and see the dynamics. See like who is the porn, con the average porn consumer? What are they like? And it's pretty much... They so, pretty much nail every stereotype you could think of. Right. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like 50-year-old computer geek, uh, big belly, has no friends. He's like probably hairy. Yeah. Close. You're probably a little bit younger. Okay. Your mid-30s. But uh, yeah, glasses, balding, overweight. Yeah. Most of the guys are like that. A lot. Or they're, like, they're the, the two nerd stereotypes, the, the balding fatter guy or the super scrawny guy. Yeah. They're, they're those two stereotypes. That's basically it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not trying to be mean to. No, no, it's what it is. I'm just trying to yeah paint a paint a pretty accurate picture of what it's like. But yeah. that's that's your very that's your tip. That's the guys who at least attend these conferences right. in person. They go all the way to Vegas just to see their favorite porn star. Yep. Yeah, I can see I can see those types of people doing that yeah. to make that trip. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So you were going through your. Yeah, I mean, I got uh, did escorting, ended up then ended up getting into porn. Went through America for a while. Uh, Got got a bit sick of the industry to be to be put, quite frank. Uh, people yeah. might think it's how could you possibly get bored of having your dick sucked for a living? It's not all it's cracked up to be. It's not as fun and it's not like a party. It's a lot more professional, which is fine. Uh, but the women can the industry in general doesn't really appreciate the dudes. It's very very feminist, very liberal, woke, left leaning industry, mm. incredibly left leaning. Uh, how, how did you see? that play out in your day to day? Uh, well, when I was working, it was during Trump era. Uh, so so like, know. I'd go I'd go to set and everyone on set would be like whinging and complaining about what Trump just did. And I'm like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't say anything. Right. If I said something, I'd get, I'd get fired. Really? From, I'd, be, I'd get, they're very, the, the industry, this is what the big thing I didn't like about the industry, it's very, very heavy on cancel culture. Because it's run, it's a very female oriented industry. Like, the mentality is female. Okay. You would think it used to be very male orientated back in the day, but it, these days it is very much not. It is run by women, not necessarily as in the ones who run the companies, but they they dictate stuff through their social media influence. Right. Right. So if a girl doesn't like us, if a girl, a, a, any any big female star can nuke the career of any director or male performer like that with a tweet. Wow. Very. They have a lot of power in their hands like that. And so because of that, every, all the guys, not just the performers, but the directors, managers, everyone kisses their ass and supplicates to them and plays this feminism game, right. uh, trying to appease them. They're simultaneously like empowered whilst, whilst also being victims. It's this weird <laughs> yeah, thing, yeah. They, these weird, this weird mental gymnastics they have to play in their game, or well, they, they do play with their head to, to be in that position. So it's... it's after just seeing more and more and more of that, and to be fair, that was only in America, actually. Yeah. Europe didn't have that. Europe had a very much, the European porn, porn industry where I shot as well, very machismo. Uh, the English industry wasn't really like that either. The English one was very, very fun. They didn't really give a shit. They were, they were very, uh, the girls who were in that were kind of more in it just for the love of the game, I guess. <laughs> the Americans were very much about money and fame. Right. And that shaped, and you know, America being the home of like woke liberal ideology, California in particular, which is where most of the porn is shot, which is where it comes from, it infects the entire industry. So it creates a very, a very hostile working environment for an opinionate, an opinionated man. Right. So you yeah. you had to go into work, hear these things that you didn't necessarily agree with, and you just kind of just. 
And but I'm and I'm not the only. I wasn't the only one. Of course not. Yeah. Like, I'm just the one who decided to speak up and be an idiot. Yeah. Oh, so you <laughs> eventually did speak up. Yeah, and I got cancelled because of it. Okay. Do but you... all the other, I know there's like I, I know a dozen male performers in the industry, right? Who think the way I think, but they know if they speak up, their job's over. Yeah. And right, and I know that. I just got to the point where I was like, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this. COVID had happened. It was sort of time. Oh, same time yeah. as COVID, so the, the industry shut down for a bit. And I was like, "What? Well, okay, I've got no work because the industry shut down for a couple of months." Can't fuck. Yeah. Um, no joke. Actually, it was a quick segue. During the whole COVID thing, they literally put out. I'm not joking. They put out like this kind of info, the info pamphlet or whatever, to all the directors, like safe ways to shoot sex, to, to shoot porn, to make, to be COVID safe. No joke. One of them was like, like glory hole, like have a suck dicks through a hole in the wall <laughs> so it separates right. like you can't cough on her <laughs> oh my god <laughs> when I saw that I was like I cannot take this seriously yeah 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 I get it <laughs> it just makes no sense makes no sense um, so that coincided and I thought you know what um, let's try I'd already been writing my first book that turned into the book about how to grow your penis I'd already been writing that it's also full of like it's not just about, this book is not just about how to grow the penis, but it's also a bunch of biohacks and tips and tricks I picked up during my porn career right. that I either learnt myself or I stole from veteran performers. So it's just this, it was just this accumulation of biohacks, really. Right. And I thought, you know what, I wanted, I wanted to put that out there. I'd, already, I'd been working on it for like a year. You know, when you, when you don't have like a deadline, there's no incentive. Yeah. You can just procrastinate and prolong something for forever. Yep. And that kind of gave me the impetus I needed. I was like, okay, well, you haven't got any work now. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. You better publish it and put it out there and see yeah. how it works. And I put it out there. It did okay. Ended up doing a bit of a podcast circuit. Did very, very well. And yeah, within three months, I'd replaced my income. Really? Yeah. And so I, I was like, okay, I, if I do this full time now, not only am I helping men, I don't have to put up with all this woke bullshit and I can speak my mind now. Exactly. So I, so I made the choice. So everything to worked out. It worked out fantastically. <laughs> uh, yeah, because you get views like this, and I get you know I get gifts like this. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that in your hand you got there? This is this is the free espresso cup that I got when I purchased my Ferrari. <laughs> They're very generous at Ferrari. Uh, you know. That's a nice espresso cup. It is a nice espresso cup. Uh, <laughs> Must be made out of carbon fiber. I, I don't. Th it looks like it is, <laughs> but I don't think it's quite made out of carbon fiber. Right. <laughs> No, so so what, one of the things I'm most impressed with about about what you've done is you've actually inspired me to kind of like really take this like podcast and your personal branding very seriously is the fact that you have created these info products that help men all across the world. You sell them online, but, but what it allows you to do is it gives you freedom, freedom to be anywhere you want and to, and to, to create these products and distribute them across the Internet. Yes. Like that's that's such an amazing thing. Um, that I feel like a lot, a lot of more, more people are starting to do, but I feel like you're at the point now where you're ma you've mastered it somewhat, and you're starting to move to the next level. Yeah, that's why that's why we came out with supplement line last year. Um, me and my business partners, we decided I, I had been wanting to do a supplement line for a while, and yeah, the everything aligned perfectly, and I met the right people to do it with, and so it's when I pushed into that direction. I think the the info the info product space, the info, the selling information space. Um, I think a lot of guys try to do it, but they they copy other people too much. They don't really, unless you have a like a unique angle, a unique background, a unique perspective, a unique problem you can solve for people. You are fighting. You're trying to like, you know, carve out a tiny piece of a, of the pie amongst a big crowd of people. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of niches that are very competitive, like the making money space, for example, right? Or the you know, the social media influencer space, right? Yeah. It's a very, very competitive space. I'm fortunate in that I haven't, I found a niche in, that is not very well catered to, I don't think. I think sex education is trash yeah. on the internet. It's absolutely, well, high school sex education is even worse, right? <laughs> yeah. But what we, get, like the resources that are available to men are mostly absolutely useless. It's mostly, and I'm not trying to point fingers and, and point the blame at anyone, but it's a lot of women on YouTube, for example, trying to teach men about their penis. Yeah, you can't do that. It doesn't work. It's like me trying to teach a woman how, like how her tits work. I don't have a clue right. how your tits. Well, actually, I do, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know what it feels like to have a pair of tits. Right. Like so, I don't like. I can't help but 
you know, be cr critical of seeing female, you know, sex intimacy coaches or sex educators trying to help to help men overcome problems like er performance anxiety induced erectile dysfunction. A woman has no clue what goes through a guy's mind when he's having boner problems. Yeah. So she cannot she cannot possibly relate to it. It'd be like me trying to relate to giving birth. Yeah. I it's it's impossible for me to know what that experience feels like. I'm not biologically capable of it. Exactly. Likewise, I don't think women are capable of understanding like that that level of anxiety and pressure of like wanting a boner, but it's not 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 <laughs> happening. Not, working. not happening. <laughs> and and having done porn, I'm in a unique position where I've been through that at the highest levels of pressure. Exactly. Right? exactly. And I and I've learned from guys who have also been in that highest level of pressure for twenty odd years, exactly. and I picked their brains to do to do the job in the first place, right? So I'm in a unique position where I can take that knowledge and experience and give it to the average guy who, one, is never going to have that, that level of pressure, right? But two, now he has tools that, are, that absolutely work yeah. because they've worked at the highest levels, right? They'll definitely work for you in the bedroom with your missus. And I can speak no to that. Like, so one thing I noticed, so I remember we, we did our, our fight training together and you told me what you, what you do. And I said, sign me up. I want to I wanna check out all your products. <laughs> I remember going through your products and being actually like astonished at how well written and well put together that it, it was. Thank you. Because what's in there are applicable items that you can do that work. They just work. Yeah. Like, like the, the pillow trick you taught me, <laughs> that's a game changer, bro. <laughs> I, that's my go-to all the time. <laughs> my girl says thank you, by the way. Uh-huh. <laughs> But, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to leave them hanging on that one. I'll, get, I'll tell you what the filler trick is, yeah. because otherwise, you yeah. know, they might be like, what no, the hell is the filler trick? Go ahead and tell them the filler trick. So it's real simple. You just throw me that pillow, Ricky. What? So simply slide a, like any kind of pillow like that underneath your woman's hips. Because if you think about it, if a woman's like laying on a bed and you're doing, doing a missionary, she's laying like this, right? If I prop her, her hips specifically up, it changes the angle with which I can now penetrate and hit her G-spot, basically. Yes. So it's super simple, easy to do. Lift her up, shove a pillow under there, go to town. And, and but it, nothing changes on your part. You do the yeah. same exact motion. Yeah. It just hits different. It changes for her. Yes. Her experience is night and day different. Exactly. Yeah. And, that's very, and I, I'm glad you said that, because it's just one practical yeah. thing. I don't, I don't like airy-fairy nonsense. I don't like, that's why all my books are really like just straight to the fucking point. Right. Like, do this, 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 and this. Simple. Now, problem solved. Leave me alone. <laughs> right? It's yeah. not. It's not. I don't need to tell a story. I don't need to, to waffle on. I can just give you what actually works, exactly. and that's why I, I I like to describe my school of teaching as like practical, no nonsense sex education for men. Yeah. Because that's what it is. It's no nonsense. Yeah. I, I would say if there were PhDs in sex education, I think you have one. Thank I, you think, I mean, you get, you get an honorary degree. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, aside from sex. You also specialize in relationships, right? To, to, uh, to a degree. I mean, I'm, I have a relationship. You, you, you understand <laughs> women. You, you know how to, uh, you know the, that male-female dynamic. Yeah, and I, I, I dissect the male-female dynamic from a sexual perspective. Yeah. I think that's what I contribute. Well, that, that's kind of really, in essence, what it is. Male-female are the sexes, so they have to interact in a certain way. So there are certain uh, effective ways a man can approach a woman and vice versa? Yeah, I mean, the, the, way, I, the way I look at relationship problems and I diagnose relationship problems is like with the end in mind, right? The end in mind being like procreation. Right. It's why, it's why we get together, right? It's why men and women get into relationships in the first place is to have sex, to have kids, right? And the okay. underlying like evolutionary psychology of why certain things are attractive to women, for example, or why certain things that men do are very unattractive to women. Exactly. I think all boils down to sex. Really? Like little bits and pieces, all like when you, when you keep asking enough questions, it eventually gets to sex or what is sexy or what, would, or what a woman would select for sexual reproduction, right? So let's, like, let's take a, a, a classic question that guys will ask is like, why do women like assholes? Why do women like assholes? Yeah. What, do, what does that mean? Why do, oh, we, why oh, do women... Oh, guys. Okay. Ass, not the I asshole. Like, <laughs> okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. You're with me now. All right. <laughs> why do women... Are, are women attracted to guys who demonstrate assholeish behaviors, yes. right? Well, it's because they... 
well, they can hold. Fr There's a bunch of regions where they like, they hold frame. They're more masculine. They don't. What does take, hold frame mean? Means they live in their world. They don't live in the woman's world. Oh. It means she has like frame is a, is kind of a hard concept to describe in in one sentence. But it's like she, she has to enter into my frame, and my frame is just is simply the way I view the world. Right. Because if, we, if you look at this world, the Western society we live in right now, most of our life is lived through, you would say, a female frame, a feminist frame. We live in a feminist society, right? So everything is done through that perspective. It's, not, it's done through the perspective of what's best for the women, right. the woman or women in general. Everything is kind of interpreted and taken through that lens. Um, it's not taken through the lens of what's best for me as a man, right? So if I approach the world, if I approach life from the perspective of, well, and this is actually the correct, I would argue this is the correct way and a healthy way to do this in a relationship. What is best for me as the man? We, we do things in this, according to that rather than what's best for her. And the reason for that is the hierarchy of a family. It goes man, woman, child. That is the traditional patriarchal hierarchy of a family, which has worked for millennia and does still work. And we've tried to convince people that it doesn't, that it's backwards, that we need to be egalitarian. That doesn't work. It's not a, a relationship isn't, or a marriage isn't, isn't a partnership. It's a hierarchy. Right. That's very... It, people... I hear people say that all the time. It's a, oh, it's a partnership, it's yeah. a partnership. I want to marry someone I can be a partner with, a best friend, blah, blah, blah. That's not correct. Yeah. It's not correct. It's a hierarchy. Someone has to lead. Yeah. And if it's not the dude, it's the woman by default. She will lead. Okay. And I'm kind of getting back to your original point, right? Why do women, you know, initiate most divorces? Why do women initiate most breakups? It's because the dude doesn't lead. And if a guy ain't leading the relationship, taking charge, make, being decisive, making the decisions, Telling her, like, stopping her, like, allowing her to not think. Yeah. That is the biggest blessing a guy can give a woman, is the ability for her to switch her brain off. Because she knows she's with a man she can trust. She knows she's with a man who will keep her safe, who is situationally, even something as simple as walking through this port down here. He's situationally aware. Right. He's constantly scanning. He's know what, he knows what's around. If, some, if there's a fight kicking off, you know, 10 meters in front of us, he's, a, he's seen it before she's heard it. Right. And he's, diver he's like, oh, we're going to walk this way now. Yeah. Like little subtle things. Have you seen that TikTok where it's a guy and a girl walking through an airport and it goes to her face and she's like, wake it up, wait downtown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, all right, there's two guys right here, two guys to the left, one right here. It's like, exactly, that's exactly what it's it is. exactly what it is. Yeah. And I've had so many girlfriends tell me, like, I love that I can just turn my brain off around you. And I honestly think that's, that's where most women want to be. Women don't want to be leading and making decisions and all these kind of things. This is also why women, I, I think most women should not be in the workforce because it adds way too much pressure. Like the, like the average, you know, white collar desk job or like corporate job adds way too much pressure yeah. to a woman's life. Women do not handle pressure the same way men handle it. They don't, they don't. It, 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 and it makes them masculine. And they, they go to the work, workplace, rambling a bit, I'm a bit all over the place, but whatever. No, go ahead, they go, go ahead. They go to the, women go to the workforce, they're, they're working a corporate job, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility, cool. That puts them in their masculine, their masculinism. So that's, not, that's not the natural feminine state of being. And then they go home to their man, who's also been in, in that very competitive environment, and what happens? The two of them are com combative. They're, by default, they're in a combative state of mind right. the moment they see each other. It takes, and then if they're doing, if they're, you know, if they are aware of this, then she will do things to get herself back into a more feminine frame of mind, and he'll do things to keep her more feminine, like, like leading, what? like leading, yeah. like telling her what to do, like, like, j even something as simple as, baby, wear that red dress, we're going to this place tonight, eight o'clock, wear those shoes, like, making decisions for her, something as simple as that will oh, allow her to relax, let go, oh, he's got it, oh, yeah. I don't have to think anymore, oh, now I can switch off from the mental mode I was in and work, that masculine energy, I can finally get back to my feminine. I think women, I think a lot of relationships would do a lot better if women weren't in the workforce and in that masculine all day, because right. they can naturally be a lot more feminine. Right. And I think any woman listening to this will understand exactly what the fuck I'm talking about, because she's felt the difference. Women who've been in it, you know, more than like two relationships, know the difference between being with a guy who is masculine and puts her in a feminine versus being in a relationship with a guy who's a pussy right. and she has to lead. You were, you were saying that you've been in relationships before whether you were in a more feminist frame of mind. Yeah, and, and those never work out because, because you always get into those modes where it's like it's a compromise. We have to like meet some way. And I, and I do remember 
uh, later in the later years, switching that frame. And actually, the first girl I tried this with, I, I think I came across some masculine material, say. And then I was like, oh, this is an interesting concept. Like, this sounds right. Yeah. So I, just, I read as much as I could about it. And then, like, I took notes. Like, you, you lead them. You tell them what to do. You, you show confidence. You uh, Even, like, when they're stressed out, you have to remain calm, even if you might be freaking out of your mind. Yeah. Um, that made the world a difference because they trust you. They yeah. look at you like, like you have everything under control and you're going to make the decision whether I agree or not. That's exactly how that works. And so I'm, I'm wondering for you, were you, have you always been in this, this frame? Or like, how were your earlier relationships? Exactly like you just described. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. High school, high school relationships, early, like late teens, early 20s relationships, exactly like you just described. Yeah. From this like egalitarian feminist point of view, absolute dumpster fire <laughs> of a relationship. <laughs> Terrible, didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, made that mistake like a few times before yeah. I was, the definition of insane, doing the same thing again and again and I, expecting a different result. It's, it's really sad because I, have, I still have friends like who, who, are, who still deal with these sort of dynamics and I look at them knowing what I know and I'm just like, bro, if you just like switch your fucking balls on, they, <laughs> they could fucking listen to you. And like, I know guys who literally have spent years with women who have, they have kids with. They don't respect them. They fucking cheat on them. Yeah. They go out, they don't listen to them. And it's like, it's sad to see. It's sad to see because it's not meant to be like that. And, and, the, and the woman isn't happy in that situation. Yeah, she's not. Like, you can't, the, prob, the problem is you can't really listen to the words that women say. And that sounds bad. But, explain. but, but, because they'll, they'll just say things because they're in, a, they're in an emotional state at that point. Or they'll say things because you've said, them, you've said something to a woman that has made her feel a certain way. Doesn't mean what she's saying, like, she doesn't, she doesn't have any, like, core belief behind what she's saying and more importantly what she does her actions in the real world are the only true indicator of how she actually what she actually responds to right you know so a woman will say like if i know if I'd, we'd cut this clip up and i put up put out something saying on my instagram for example saying look tell women what to do like tell her what to wear like what time to be ready wear this dress wear this wear these shoes blah blah blah, blah. You tell like this is this is what you should do for a first date I will get a comment or a dozen comments in there from surprisingly, or rather unsurprisingly, ugly middle-aged women <laughs> saying, right. oh, I would never let a man do that for me. Oh, if a man said that to me, I wouldn't go on a date with him. Well, correct. No man wants to go on a date with you because you're fat and ugly and you're middle-aged. But the pretty women, the, one that every, the women that men are actually attracted to, they fall head over heels for that. They love it. They absolutely love it. So... Certain women, women will sabotage other women. Yeah. Like women are really nasty like that, especially like online and internet. Women will say things because they, and I'm not, I'm not even sure if they're even consciously aware of this, but they're gonna, they'll say things that is, they'll, they'll give other women advice, which is dog shit, which is the complete opposite of what women <laughs> should be doing. They should not listen to women. And I think it's subconsciously like a competitive thing. They're like, oh, I know that like, I don't really believe this. I'm going to say this so the pretty girl over here makes a fucking bad decision so I can actually get a guy. Women will do, especially as they get older, they start to age out or they, they get fatter or they get uglier, they'll start to give some really shit advice right. to young women. Like, I mean, that's the crux of feminism, really. Like, feminists are never really the prettiest yeah. or the happiest women. Yeah. yeah, they are. And they're out here trying to convince all these really, like, impressionable young women that, you know what? Being a mother is you know, victim of being a mother is oppression. Loving, like having beautiful, loving, having beautiful kids that you love and adore, that's not happiness, that's not fulfillment. You know what's fulfillment? Working a slave wage job for Megacorp over here, that's true fulfillment. Yeah. No, like it's, it's just mind boggling that people can fall for this bullshit. It's a fucking psyop. I mean, if you look at all the, the rom-com movies from the fucking 2000s, like every movie, they constantly push this agenda where the man is like this funny, goofy guy. The bumbling <laughs> idiot. Yeah, the bumbling idiot. Yeah. And like, and, and all throughout, you know, all throughout those movies, you constantly are getting those messages pushed on society, which is why America has ended up in the state that it's in, where we don't have like a solid, consistent, forming base of nuclear families, no. like at all. And you see that play out in the cities because everything from the micro to the macro is connected. If you have one family 
who's dysfunctional that turns into multiple families, which turns into a community, which turns into a state, which turns into a country, which can turn into the fucking world, yeah. which is how these ideologies spread all across the world. And now you have fucking just horrible results, horrible societies everywhere. A lot, a lot of places. <laughs> and, and, and the only real solution to it all is, to, is for men to, like, I like that phrase you used before, I'm going to steal it, for men to switch their balls on. <laughs> 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 because, it, okay, like, especially in the space that I'm kind of in, yeah. on, on Twitter in particular, and, and YouTube to a lesser degree, there's a lot of guys, you might call it like the, the red pill space, the incel space, like people sort of conflate a lot of these things together. Yeah. Whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of bitter men in there. And, and look, objectively, I'm going to say they've got, a, they've got a reason to be bitter. They've spent, they, they were raised to brainwashed with, through every TV show they watched, every movie they watched, all the music they listened to, all the media they are absorbing is telling them, oh, act like a bitch and women will like you. Right. That's what they've been told, basically. Like, my favorite example is uh, Ross from Friends. Uh. The absolute peak little bitch and he just kept like Rachel just runs circles around him all his life he's in love with her he's in love with her and she just doesn't give a fuck about him <laughs> and then eventually he gets her because right. that of course that's how reality works of course right, right. of course but these guys in this space they have like okay like, it's, if you looked at it objectively like okay you'd probably be feel, you'd feel pretty bitter too if you've been lied to your whole life of course you would uh, every woman you've had a relationship with or interacted with you're, you're doing what you're supposed to be exactly. doing, what you've been told to, yeah. be, to be, being a good boy, being a nice gentleman, being like, no, nothing wrong with being a gentleman, but without any balls behind you, right? right? Not having, like, you've been told deliberately to tone down the very essence of your masculinity, the very essence of manhood, and then women will like you, and they don't. Yeah. You're like, what's going on? I've been like, the whole world told me I should be doing this and it's not working. But again if, and again and again and again. If this, is, if this is a PSYOP, if it seems like this is an intentional agenda that's being pushed, yes. the next Very question so. is why? Separate the family, right? If you break apart the family, you na like family used to be, like I said, with the, with the hierarchy, right? Man, woman, child. It's a very clear hierarchy. It's a structure. It's orderly. And the, men are, the man's in charge of making decisions for the household. Women are the primary consumers. There's a couple of reasons here. Women are primary consumers of the household now, right? Uh, they make they make a lot of the purchasing buying decisions, whilst men own the money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, when you break apart the family like that into you know individualized units, cool. You now have a whole fifty percent of the population you can control through media. You can influence their buying habits. You can influence their voting habits, right? And yeah. women are far more susceptible to groupthink than men are. Yeah. Far more susceptible to to, to brainwashing and all these kinds of things, because they're biologically programmed to be more susceptible. They're yeah. bi if we, we, we come from like small tribal groups where we're supposed, where being an outcast means death, right? Yeah. Being, and men are the ones who are risk takers. Women, in fact, women are, this, this goes back to this point I made ages ago about uh, women being attracted to assholes, right? Women are, you can look at the asshole. a better way to look at a man who you might call an asshole is risk taker. Right. Women are attracted to s successful risk <laughs> yeah, yeah. takers, right? However, back in the day, if you were an unsuccessful risk taker, you would just be dead. Right. Yeah. Think about the guy who, in a, in a modern example, the guy who uh, rides motocross and does like a full backflip on a motorcycle. That's a risk taker. But that guy is attractive to women because he's a successful risk taker. The guy who didn't complete the backflip <laughs> broke his neck and is dead. So he doesn't even, doesn't even count. You're right. Right? Right. So from the women's perspective, all they actually see, because all that's left, are the successful risk takers. Right. And that is something that women have been biologically programmed to be attracted to. The successful risk takers are the ones who end up running the tribe. They're the ones who slay the, who kill the lion. They're the ones who kill the woolly mammoth and provide a feast for everyone. The one who takes the risk is the one who, who wins. Right? So that idea of being a successful risk taker is like hardwired into being attractive to women. Yeah. All right, so we had some technical difficulties, guys. Uh, let's, let's light up one of your cigars. We're going to celebrate this. <laughs> <laughs> but we were talking about the nuclear family, right? Mm. And I think, like, this is so true, and it's, it showed especially in how 
the U.S. government approached the issue of black families in America, one of the first things that they did was take the fathers out of the homes. You know, did you know that they incentivized the mothers to have the father outside of the home so that they could get welfare checks? Yeah. And so, like, they did that. And also, when they uh, flooded the hoods with drugs, they yep. put all the men in jail. Yep. It literally decimated the black community. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of like, that's the reason why a lot of you know, our population are living the way that we live. Before the welfare state in America, it's my knowledge, to my knowledge, black Americans had a lower divorce rate 100%. than whites did. Yeah. Which is, which, if you, like, looking at the, the state things are in now today, it's mind-blowing that that was ever the case. Uh, a thousand percent. But it's a welfare state that does it. It's, it's incentives. If you incent, like, you can understand a lot about the way the world works and the way things are just by looking at incentives. Incentives are the thing that drive the world. Right. Like, if you, people can, uh, and this is what happens with a lot of government programs, actually, is people can design a system or design a program, a, a, a welfare pro program or something, with an intention to get a desired outcome, but they don't look at the incentives they're putting in front of people, and it produces a completely different outcome. One, of the, one such example is, you know, paying single mothers. Yeah. Uh, uh, child, like, child support welfare like this for yeah. single mothers. What does it incentivize? It, set, it incentivizes women to kick the man out of the home. Exactly. Rather, like the intention of the program was, oh, let's support women who, whose, far, whose man has left them, right. right? It's done the complete opposite. It's encouraged the women to kick the dude out of the home so they can get more money. They said that that's what they intended to do, but I, I think like, like with all, you know, a lot of the government psyops, they, they have a bigger agenda here. You know, I, I don't think they, they want to see you know, blacks succeed or, or at this point, <laughs> any family succeed with how they're pushing these, these messages. Yeah, because you can't, if you can break the family apart, the family's easy to control. Yeah. Say, cigarette, the, like, you've got 50% of the voting population. If you think of it like this, as simple as how easy to brainwash and manipulate women are emotionally, they're very, very easy to emotionally manipulate. Right. En masse, they're very susceptible to being, to being told that, you know, this is the right thing to do or, that, or to being shamed into things. That's the best, best way of describing it. Women are very, very susceptible to shame uh, especially group shame, collective shame, yeah. it'll dictate their uh, their actions. If you break the family apart like that, very, very easy to control 50% of the population. Now, if women are in a household, a patriarchal household where the man's in charge, he is he acts like a buffer to that brainwashing. Right. Right. She might see something in a paper or hear something at coffee with her friends. She comes home to a family, a structure, where the man's in charge and he leads her. He's like, baby, that's bullshit. Here's why. Don't worry about that. I got this. Yep. Right. But if she doesn't have that man in the house to do that for her, or if she's been taught to not listen to her man, mm. to not respect her man, that she's a strong, independent woman and he can't tell her what to do. She needs to think for herself. Think for herself means tell, follow what daddy government says, mm -hmm. basically. Then you lead to the shithole that we're in right now. Exactly. <laughs> and um, I... I understand this perfectly because my grandparents have been together they they were married for 65 years and like i was raised in that household so i saw firsthand how like constructive it was for me i got to see my grandfather he, he was a taxi driver so he'd go out and work you know all hours of the day he'd come back my grandmother would have dinner cooked or well, we wouldn't eat together as a family mostly but dinner was cooked and there was still that hierarchy you yeah. know so and and it worked yeah. Compl and complimentary roles. Exact complimentary roles. You're not exactly. trying to. Yeah, there's no, there's no point in having like, you don't you can't have two leaders, right? You can't have two leaders. That's why every every ship has a captain and then a first mate, right? Every corporation has a CEO, and then everyone else a CFO. Everyone's got their role. Yeah. Everyone's got their complimentary like positions within the organization. A family's no different. A relationship's no different. If you've got two people competing with each other trying to to achieve the same goals. It's just not going to work. 100%, yeah. 100%. So this is a good segue into our, our, our subject of, of intimacy in marriage. So <clears throat> I'm 33 now, and I'm at the point where I'm considering marriage. Well, not even considering. I want to get married within the next uh, couple of years because I see how important it is to have a family and procreate. There are a lot of families, couples, who struggle with intimacy in their relationship. So like, if you've been married to somebody for 20 years yeah. and you're just fucking the same old puss, that shit gets a little, <laughs> little old after a while. Like, you're the, the uh, intimacy coach. Uh, what, what do you recommend 
for that specific problem? It sucks. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's a problem that's unique to men, too. What do you mean? Women don't have this problem. If a woman is in love with her man, she will have that same dick every day, multiple times a day, the, love it. the rest of her life, and it'll never get boring. Yeah. With men, it is a lot harder. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's a lot, lot harder. And I, I, I run into this problem a lot. It's, I actually run into this problem. I get a lot of my friends who are very successful men privately a DM me this exact problem. It seems to be exacerbated the more successful you are as a man, uh, and therefore the more options you have as a man. Of course. It exacerbates this need for, or this desire rather, for variety. Now, people will, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll come back to the original point, I'm segueing a bit here, yep. but people will, will try to pretend like our grandparents' generation were these picture-perfect marriages, picture-perfect relationships where no one ever cheated on anyone else. Yeah. Uh, the man never got bored of having just one partner his whole life. Never happened. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that <laughs> I know enough guys from that generation. I know enough old men. Like, I'm friends with all my dad's friends. Like, I know enough guys from that generation, at least in Australia. It's probably the same across the, the, same across the world. Yeah. People were fucking around, right? The difference was, it was a shitload easier to hide that you, the fact that you were fucking around back then, right? Right? Because no social media, no, no people, not everyone has a camera on them, twenty four seven, right? Uh, you're not as connected. The world wasn't, wasn't as connected. Towns were separate. Like it's just, it was so much easier for men in those generations to get away with the occasional dalliance and it not destroy the family and the relationship, right? In fact, it just, it kept it going because rather than him being resentful of the fact that he only gets to have one vagina for the rest of his life, he occasionally gets to satiate that thing that's in the back of all men's heads. He satiates it and he comes back and continues being a good father. There's countless cases like that. Now, I'm not saying that you have to do that, I'm not saying every man should do that. I'm just saying to pretend that that never happened, to pretend that older generations didn't actually do this, like the baby boomer generation and before, to pretend like that didn't exist is naive. It's human nature. It's human nature. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> humans, we naturally tend to, we have to actually overcome our human nature in a lot of circumstances, right? We have to overcome the, the, the it's human nature to try and to want to consume endless amounts of sugar. That's human nature. It's how we're like, our brains respond to sugar, our brains respond to fat, our brains respond to alcohol, right? It's human nature to just endlessly consume that stuff, but we still temper those desires, right? To live a functional life, Yeah. right? So there is, there is, I'm not sitting here trying to condone people being degenerate and cheating and stuff. It's not what I'm trying to condone. I'm just trying to make, paint a picture that's a bit more accurate than what some might lead you to believe, yeah. right? Uh, but if you, but you might you, preach a bit. Yeah, but if you look at look at Islam and how that's structured, like you're allowed up to four wives. And I think Islam as a religion is so is so um, amazing in how it's structured because they understand the, the nature of man. Well, you know what's interesting? Yeah. I, I have come across a couple of very, very interesting Twitter accounts in okay. the last two months. Uh, I think one is called, I, I think, uh, the title is called Biblical Marriages. I forget what the actual Twitter handle is. Another one is called, <laughs> I think his current handle is um, uh, biblical, biblical Concubinage or something like this. These two Twitter accounts are very interesting to follow. They actually make the argument that uh, taking multiple wives is not outlawed in the Christian Bible. Mm. Uh, this really pisses off Christians if you, uh, if you say this. It really pisses them off. Well, probably the women. Uh, and the dudes. And the oh, dudes. Okay. And the dudes. Um, yeah. I, I'm not knowledgeable enough on this topic yet. But this is... This is so I'm, I am... Uh, sorry, I hit my mic. I am... Uh, exploring Christianity, but I, I want, I, the way I phrase it is I want to be Christian and I'm learning more about Christianity as I progress. Um, I've had a couple of very interesting experiences lately. Okay. Experience which are push, yeah, which are pushing me towards okay. Christian faith. I think it's, it's my heritage, right? White, European, we're Christian. Yeah. So my, my answer, it was good enough for my ancestors, good enough for my ancestors who built Australia, built England, built Ireland. I'm, I'm, I think it's good enough for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just want to learn more about it. And yeah, this in, for some reason, this in particular, like, sorry to segue into like talking about religion oh, and go. stuff, but for some reason, like 
sex is the one thing that Christians have a big hang up over. And in, part in particular, like man's desire for variety, man's desire for multiple women. They don't really, they don't, Christians don't seem to get all, all huffy and puffy about like, thou shall not kill, for right. example, as a commandment, right? Right. When I would agree that it's perfectly acceptable to defend your family if someone breaks into your home and kill them. If you come into my home and decide that my TV is more important than my life, well, I've decided that my TV is more important than your life. Yep. You've made that contract already. Bang. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. They don't have a problem kind of reconciling that. Uh, yeah, Christians in particular seem to get, they, they, they put a lot, I see like 90% of Christian arguments evolving, talking, focusing around sex for some reason and not all the other aspects of how to live a good life. It's just, it's just an interesting observation as someone whose background is, and, and expertise and like livelihood is focusing around like sex and relationships. Yeah. I think the, the sh if you like shaming and guilting men for sexual desires is not the solution to that problem of like how do we you know how do we have a good marriage and how do we you know not cheat on our wives and remain faithful and keep a happy fa functioning family shaming and guilting men i don't think is the correct solution uh do i know what the solution is no not really um but to get back to your point to offer some some practical advice that has worked for guys is literally just being around women and not indulging in things that like exposure kind of exposing exposing yourself and i don't mean like flashing i mean <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> being a, being around female company will heighten your sex drive as a man it'll it'll heighten your sex drive okay it sounds kind and of then you will, and then you will take that sex drive and you will you know direct it direct it to your wife right cool yeah. you're happy everything's good everything's still going going yeah. fine uh to tr but to try and sit there and like willpower it away like your desire for, for a bit of strange on the side right <laughs> to try and willpower that away I think you're fighting against your nature I think it's better you have to be a bit more strategic with it I yeah think. I thought you were going to say like you know go to a sex store and start trying on some lingerie get oh some you toys. could I mean that, that's that but that's an obvious solution okay that's that's the solution everyone defaults to you know what's crazy like I didn't start getting into sex toys and lingerie until my 30s right you know so it's like I don't feel like at least my community, we, we do that shit very much. It's all about like just fucking bitches, mostly doggy style. It's like a I don't know, maybe that's a, a universal man thing. It's more of a white boy thing. Really? Like what you, lingerie and sex toys is a kinky, yeah, kinky yeah, white a guy kink thing. thing. Yeah. yeah, it's a white guy thing. Like vibrators <laughs> and shit. But like uh, the women who I introduce it to, like they absolutely love it. Right. It's yeah. new for them. It's because there's a, okay, there's it's men have what's called the Madonna whore complex, right? Where they wait, what's it called? The Madonna whore complex. Madonna whore. Yeah. Okay. So, two separate sort of female aspects. You know, um, like the Madonna is supposed to be not Madonna, the the, the musician. Yeah. She is a whore. That's the irony of her name. <laughs> um, ma the Madonna was originally, classically, was you know the the chaste beauty, the virgin bride. That was the Madonna. Right, the the woman who is yeah not promiscuous, not slutty, but she's conservative and concealed, and and would make a good wife. Right, that's the Madonna. The whore is obviously the opposite of that. Okay. And men have this complex where we want to marry and have a family with the Madonna, but we lust after the whore, and that is something that men have to try and reconcile when they have a wife. I think the way some men try to reconcile it is they marry the whore. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. They're like, I can't, they, they are so terrified of the idea of marrying a woman or being with a woman long term that isn't the most sexually arousing woman they've ever been with that they will make the shitty choice of marrying that woman and forgetting that that comes with a whole lot of baggage yes, yeah. and end up in a terrible relationship, a very combative one, and it, and it kids, falls apart. And, it and then the kids are in that, right? Then the opposite side of that problem is, okay, I marry the Madonna, but I still lust, like the lust for whores that you see and in, in interact with or come into your life is still there. And it detracts from the sex drive you have for that one woman. There's no, I, I'm, I have not found a very easy solution to it. There's one solution I know a friend has tried is just, it, like it, I have one friend who's doing this right now. He's a very, very Christian man. He's literally gotten off all social media, doesn't talk to any other women, doesn't, won't go, won't, like, won't interact with women unless his wife's around him. Like he, he takes it to the extreme extreme to try and suppress his lust. Wow. So that he can only channel it into his woman. 
Okay, that is an option, but it's not a very practical one for most people, unfortunately. Right. right. So you ha the, the psychological trick I have given guys in the past is you have to try to find a way and this is the pro this is the again this is the Donna Hall complex this is the problem that men have and women struggle to understand this is that once you actually like a woman you actually start to if you actually start to respect her you don't want to treat her like a whore you don't want to treat her like a whore yeah yeah you don't want to treat her like that like but the, the weird thing is like I've I've said this to my girlfriend for example she's like why treat me like the whore <laughs> like I want to be treated like the whore I want you to last after me like the whore I'm like I like you too much. <laughs> you're, right. you're actually nice. Right. <laughs> like, you're pleasant. You're nice. Yeah. You know, and, and that that's there's something about that. I think it's about a primal thing in men, where, yeah, we we it brings out there's something in that whorish nature of a woman that brings out a lot more of that animalistic yeah. lust in men yeah. than the very loving, pleasant, bubbly, feminine, motherly. Figure. Yeah, I think I'm just a degenerate because I have no issue like finding like a good nice girl and then slutting her out. Like I fucking turn into a complete whore. I right. like, oh you like, I love the and that, fact. And that's the solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and that's in, in public, she's she's your woman. She's respect you respect, but in private, you indulge that yeah. shall we say darker side yeah. of male sexual nature where you, for want of a better phrase, slut your woman out, but just to yourself. Yeah, just it's just a private thing, but you. You, you bo both of you go there. Like you go to that kind of darker, twisted place sexually, where you kind of objective, where you not kind of, but you, where you objectify her. Yeah. And you allow her to explore that space too, so she can embrace her full sexuality. She can get all kind of kinky and perverted, but privately just for you. Right. She's not a public slut. She's a private slut. Yeah. And I think that's the way to do men it. have to reconcile it. It's a ment It's a mental game. Yep. You kind of have to play with yourself. Fuck the universe is mental. Yeah. So. So I have a 13 year old son and uh, he's about to be 14 next month. And a few weeks ago, I had the sex conversation with him, which, uh. was, which was interesting. Huh. Even though I knew he had already knew about sex, he was taught like the sex education in school and they have friends, they all, they do like the shit, right? But I just, I wanted to make it an official conversation. I sat him down at the table, I said, listen son, I just, I went through the basics, you know? This is the penis. It was, you know, you, you got one. <laughs> 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 but, but you, you take this, you put it inside the woman. Uh, you you ejaculate inside of her. She has babies. I just kind of told him like, listen, when you get older, it's going it's going to be fun. It's going it's going to feel great. Don't have no kids. <laughs> right. Don't have no kids too early. Yeah, that's like one of the worst things you can do. Um, I, hopefully, he you know he can he can understand that. I think when he gets a little bit older, I'll start to get into a little more detail about you know dominance and kind of like all that kind of stuff but i wanted to get your opinion on like if you had a son how would you approach the topic of sex right and then also after that i want you to talk about how, how would you approach it with your daughter yeah that's two, two very different yes. conversations right i with a guy I'd, I'd try to drill into him that is not something to be like your desires are not something to be sh ashamed of yeah or, that's, or that's feel a, guilty for because i think that I, at least i feel like that's how we were brought up in australia the, the kind of the default, I think, in Western society is for men to kind of feel a bit of shame and guilt around like sexual desire. Yeah, he, he was a little uneasy when I brought it up. He was like, "Oh, it's an awkward conversation." Yeah, it's an awkward conversation to have, of course. Um, yeah, I think covering the covering like covering the basics of <laughs> how, here's how you get a woman pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> here's how likely it is, especially as the young the younger you are. It's very very you're like firing on all cylinders and she's just ready to accept everything, right? So <laughs> yeah. very, very high risk, that's right? I had a kid when I was 20. Right. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's why your kid's 14. <laughs> exactly. Understanding those basics and then understanding a bit about STDs, I think is a very important start because you you would, and, and actually the cover those basics first and then the, the next big thing I'd teach him is that losing your, I, I talk about like losing his virginity. I talk about, I actually have, I made a video on this really recently, but your first sexual experience is probably going to be shit, and that's totally okay. It's not supposed to be. Relax. It's it's like like it's a skill. Sex is a skill. This is something I would have to drill into the, yeah. my son because it's a skill that's actually on. It's the guy's burden to be good at this skill, yeah. like like basically everything yeah. else, right? So it's another burden he has to bear. But it's okay. You will get better at it with practice. Right. I wish somebody would have told me that. But I, was, yeah. I was nervous and sweating. Yeah. I was like, oh. It, but g giving him permission to fail the f like on the first few times, like I think that's important. Otherwise, guys can develop a complex, and they can develop, and because of that complex, they can develop bad ha bad like 
uh, I guess symptoms, right? Like performance anxiety, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation can all stem from having a rather traumatic few early experiences of sex where they too much shame, too much guilt, too much pressure on themselves. They blow things out of proportion right. and they're like, oh God, they get in the head, they develop a complex and now they've got a problem. Do not want that at all. So you take away the pressure, you take away the burden, let them know it's okay. You can fuck up the first time. It's not a big deal. You're not going to be good at it. No one's expecting you to be good at it. Just all you can do is bring enthusiasm. Just be enthusiastic. Yeah. Simple as that. Or get drunk. Chill. I, actually, I would say don't get drunk. Yeah. I would say don't get drunk. Yeah. You have, you'll, have, you'll have more, you'll actually be able to enjoy and experience the thing a lot more fully. Um, it just see. you know what? The being, being drunk, obviously, it, it just relieves all the pressure. You're just kind of yeah. like, whatever the fuck happens, fuck it. <laughs> you know what? I heard, this is a bit of a segue, but I heard a really, really interesting uh, quote analysis of what getting drunk in inebriation does to you. Because really? there's this common, there's this, okay, there's this common understanding, or common, uh, you know, it's known, right, that alcohol gives you courage. Right. Right. Liquid courage. Liquid courage, right? Does it though? Does alcohol actually give you courage? The argument that I've, I've recently heard, and this is a very, very compelling one, is it doesn't actually give you courage. Okay. What is courage, right? Courage is your ability to face fear. Your, courage is your willingness to go forward with something in spite of having fear. Right. right. Alcohol doesn't give you courage. It reduces your fear. Right. Things that uh, were making th this thing that made you fearful has been diminished. You haven't actually gained courage. You've just lost a bit of fear. So alcohol actually doesn't give you courage. It actually robs you of the ability to be courageous. Ooh. Because in the absence of fear, you can't be courageous. If there's no fear, if the fear has been taken away, you can't, by default, you cannot be courageous. So alcohol does not give you courage. It, it robs you of the ability to be courageous. That's an interesting point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's why I mentioned that. Okay. <laughs> oh, Thanks for mentioning that. That was a good bit. Um, so and then what, would you, what advice would you give your daughter? Whew. Don't try it try as best you can to not uh follow flights of fancy don't be uh susceptible try not to be no you're a woman try not to be so susceptible to your emotions because a man the wrong kinds of men can manipulate your emotions just to get in your pants yeah right yeah. and i can tell i can tell all this honestly as a guy who's you know slept around quite a bit and has friends who've slept around quite a bit i'm like honey trust me dad knows yeah dad knows the kind like and I'd say, look, if you want to be with a guy, if you want to introduce yourself, if you, you better fucking introduce him to me first. <laughs> like, or, and on top of that, I'd have a brother's chaperone and shit. Like, okay. I've thought about this shit already. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like I, I don't think, plan. like, I can't be around my daughter all the time, but her, like, younger brother or older brother certainly can be around her when I'm not there. Yeah. Like, the idea of her being chaperoned is something I'm very keen on. Because I think women make fucking appalling choices in men. Especially when they're younger. Yep. Right? They are not equipped or qualified to choose a good man. They are, all they, all they do is they just follow emotions. And women need, and, the mo and in particular, women follow the guy who gives them the most variety of emotions. Everything. That's the ups and the downs. The guy who breaks her heart, she's still addicted to him. The guy who treats her lovely, his emotional variance is a flat line. The really, really nice guy yep. who's just giving her, like being very nice to her all the time. There's no, no emotional variance, right? Yeah. It, doesn't really, it doesn't even matter like how much emotion a guy gives a woman. It's the amount of variance he gives a woman. It's the thing that really pings women. Yeah. It's like a slot machine. It's an emotional, the guy who is an emotional slot machine to a woman is the guy who can keep her around. Yeah. Like she ain't leaving that guy. She's addicted to that. Why, what makes a slot machine addicted? It's the fact that you can, like you pull that lever and you don't know if it's going to be a win or a loss. And there's just enough wins in that to keep you <laughs> coming back, yeah. to keep you hooked. Yep. That's the same way like piece of shit guys treat women. They, they'll give her tons of like negative emotions yeah. and every now and then just enough positive ones. That positive might only come in the form of sex every now and then to be honest too, right? Yep. But there's enough of that variance that keeps her hooked, yeah. keeps her around. Like, like the, 
a gambling addict sitting yeah. there at the slot machine. It's like it's like if, if you go if you have a room full of like you know fifty men, you always see like that one guy who's like boisterous, loud, and he's doing this and calling people out, and like he's all over the place and he's kind of like dominating the space of men. Like women are attracted to that because it's like it's like you said, it, it gives you those range of emotions. That's, this is somebody who doesn't give a shit, like the bad yeah. boy, the asshole. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's a, he's well in that circumstance, right? He's what 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 is the sub-communication that's going on there, right? It's not, it's not the words he's saying, yeah. it's what, what can a woman infer about this man from his actions and from that situation, right? He's confident in himself, he has high self-esteem, he's a leader of men, if he's able to command a room, command he can command attention, right? Uh, this is why guys who, quick segue, this is exactly why even the ugliest motherfucker on the planet, if he's on a stage, is attractive to women. Oh shit, I'm about to be a public speaker. <laughs> think of it, think of, Every ugly musician you know. There's lots of them. Yep. Think Ed Sheeran, not a good looking guy. What about Lizzo? Doesn't matter. <laughs> the female, the, doesn't, doesn't work for men. Does not work for men. This does not work the other way around. I'm sure she has some big guy fans. She's probably got, yeah, some fat fan. Yeah. <laughs> a chubby chaser. Yep. Uh, but you put a guy on a stage, commanding a group of people, gathering attention from a group of people, women will be immediately attracted to that guy. It's, it's just social proof. It's basic social proof. Yeah. So all these things, like that, exa that example you gave, all of the things that he's doing are sub-communicating very, very attractive traits about him. Exactly. Yeah, yeah so that, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, and when it comes to, to relationships, like let's talk about the, the guys who consistently go out and pay for sex. Ah. What do you think about the lasting effects that that behavior has on the man as far as his dynamics when he tries to re-enter mm. the space with, with women? I think it gives that guy a false sense of confidence. It gives him an unrealistic sense of what he is entitled to. Yeah. Because he is paid, like, you know, objectively a gorgeous woman in a trans a purely a transaction to have sex with him, right? He is going to go out into the world and assume that he can get that 10 out of 10 looking woman by default because he's been with one before. Yes. It's absolutely not the case. It's kind of, that's kind of the male equivalent. Here's, here's what the equivalent is for women, right? That, the dude who pays for sex like that, who then gets an overinflated sense of like accomplishment. Right. Whether he, whether he actually believes it or not himself, like there's probably a lot of doubt in the back of his mind, but it's still floating around there in the service and it's still there when he talks to other people. He's, he's the kind of guy who is full of shit, right? And you can tell he's full of shit, but what he's saying makes sense. Like he's saying things that are correct. Yep. But I know this guy doesn't have the fucking experience to back this up. He's full of shit somewhere. Yeah. Right. This holes. He's like a. He's like a piece of cheddar cheese. Yeah. You know. There's just sh holes fucking everywhere. And, and I would argue it's not like, congruent. Yeah. I would also argue that that consistent behavior of paying for sex, when when it comes time to get into a real relationship you the man would think that it's transactional as well you would say oh well i, I just took you to dinner you should suck my dick <laughs> <laughs> well it's kind of like the way you do it. and he's from and he's probably going to be used to women leaving but they're still all saying escorts are paid to leave they're not paid to, like you pay the escort to leave yeah that's what the that's the that's the the beauty of the, of the arrangement it's like get your rocks off she walks out the door i don't have to sit there and listen to bullshit anymore yeah that guy is not going to be capable or not we well, might be capable but he's not going to have a very easy time adapting to women a woman sleeping in his bed with him conversing cuddling yeah. with like all these things that go along with a relationship he's not going to be very good at adapting to that yeah um the female equivalent of the situation is the right. woman who gets damn it right. it's just it's just my one okay. the female equivalent of that situation is the woman who ends up just randomly getting banged by some celebrity or rapper or something like that, right? Some guy who's really high clout. And from that point onward, she can't lower her standards. Yep. Because she, you know... She thinks she has this false inflated sense of ego. Like, yes. she's like, I'm up here, I can be with these guys. But what she doesn't realize is that guy was just like, looking to get his rocks off. Exactly. Easily, yeah. quickly, without any effort, right? She was the outlet for that circumstance. Now she has this inflated sense of ego and she cannot humble herself to lower her standard for the kind of man she, will, she wants to get in a relationship with. Exactly. So that's the kind of equivalency, I think. Yeah. So, so when you go into relationships with women and you want to fuck other women, are you honest with your, with your girl? Also, like, what advice do you give to men when they want to sleep around? How honest should they be? I have been honest in the, like the last shit, four, 
the last four girlfriends I've had over the last couple of years, I've been honest everything with, from the get-go. I'm like, look, I like threesomes. If you like girls, fucking fantastic. Let's do this together, basically. Uh, that's the ideal scenario. That's much, much better, I think. Yeah, but look, I love you. You're amazing. If I, if I step out occasionally, it doesn't mean, does not mean I do not want to spend you know, our relationship together. It does not mean you are any... And this is the big one, like, women, women, women feel like they're... If their man sleeps around, for some reason they kind of... They f get this feeling that they're replaceable or that they're lesser than or that they're not beautiful anymore or that he doesn't love them anymore. None of these things are true. Right. None of these things are true. It's... They project that uh, when, when the guy sleeps around and it's... It's, like it's a shame. It's the same meal every day. Like nobody wants rice and chicken every day. Like, yeah, you gotta get unless steak. you're a bodybuilder. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the, the analogy sticks. It makes sense yeah. to the guy. And again, I'm not trying to justify it. Um, I'm just, I've just been honest with my girlfriend's past. Man, look, this is you are attracted to me because of the way I am. You are attracted to this. Okay. Let me explain exactly what this is. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a G statement. <laughs> Whether okay, because because then you have the choice to walk away or stay. Right. And then I so I I am trying to remove any uh, guilt I could possibly feel because I have explained to you very clearly that this is who I am. This is what I'm like. This is my proclivities, my tendencies. Not ju not trying to justify them. Uh, I'm just being honest with you, right? Right. And so you can now make the choice to. Stay or leave, and none. And by the way, none of these women have ever tried to change me. Okay. Ever. Oh, yeah. They so that they, they can't. You know, I mean, there's that. There's that. Yes. And it's within. My, it's, it's. You know, you could make the argument. Oh, you know, should he be sleeping around? Probably not. But I have done it in the past. Yeah. You know. So, I think just being completely up, like straightforward and honest with it. If that's where you decide to go. Now, today with my. The girlfriend I'm with right now, who I who I'm going to be having a family with, that is not something I want to do. Okay. I've made the conscious choice that that is not something I want to. I mean, keep well, when you've had so. a long career of sex and orgies, I don't think you need it anymore. Yeah. The, the, nothing, the, nothing more. There's no more variety that you could experience. Right? You know what's funny is that I've got friends who, you know, have been equally as promiscuous as me, and so, for some of them, they're they're kind of in the stage. Some of them are like where I'm at now, where it, that thrill of the chase isn't really there anymore. It's kind of, I f feel like it's kind of burnt out a bit. Yep. And I've got other friends, that flame is never dying. <laughs> no matter what happens. They, yeah. they constantly have that. Some that guys are just wired time. differently. Yeah. Yeah. I, Very I much I don't so. think I need that much. Like, just give me Very like, uh, so. a couple of nice variety. You know, I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I think we kind of discussed on that earlier. So, would you wait to have sex with a traditional woman? She comes to you. She's uh, in her in her values. She, she stands firm in her values and her principles. Maybe her religion. She doesn't want to have sex before marriage. Is that something that you would yeah. consider? I mean, before marriage. I mean, I'm I am not that kind of Christian, shall we say? Okay. I mean, I'm not there, you know. So one, I don't think I'd ever get. I don't, I don't think I'd ever actually meet a girl like that. Why? To be pra to be. Practically honest, I just don't think it's very likely for me to run to run into the run into the kind of woman who is going to be that devout in her principles that she waits till marriage. That is exceptionally rare. Not an Even, Islam. Not an Islam. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm looking at it from a Christian perspective. Well, there, but there's, there's no like um, a strong Christian countries that practice? there are there are there are, but I think it, they. Uh, okay. It's a okay, okay, okay. Is she a virgin if she sucked the dick? No. <laughs> so, I think there's still, even in, even in, and this might piss a lot of people off, even in Islamic countries, there's a lot of women who are virgins who have done something with a man. A little ass play. Maybe that. Yeah. Maybe a hand job here. Maybe a blow job here or there. If, in, look, in the, in the Arab world, vaginoplasty is a very common thing. Is it, no, what's it called? Uh, like a hymen reconstruction surgery is very common. Oh, really? Yes. And I know this because I had a, I have had a Muslim girlfriend. I've had a, an Emirati girlfriend. Really? Yes. And and it's in in that part of the world. It is a lot more common than the average Muslim man would like to believe. The virgin he is marrying, she, her hymen was torn before, and she had a time in reconstruction surgery. Wow. It's a lot more common than that's you think. news to me. 
a lot more common. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. That's that's interesting because I mean I, I've never heard of that before, and I didn't even know a hymen reconstruction surgery is possible. <laughs> but it's it's you don't, you don't really see that in the Western world. Right. You see it in the Arab world where like that is kind of like a prerequisite prerequisite on the night of marriage. She has to have a hymen. Otherwise, this marriage is null and void. And in fact, I think there is actually there there is even doctors that they can the husband or the the husband's family can request the bride go to a doctor to check that the hymen is intact. Really? Before they can, you know, approve the marriage. That's interesting. Yeah. Imagine this, this does be, happen. Meeting a girl, she tells you she's a virgin. <laughs> I will take you to the doctor to get checked. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's some pretty gangster stuff. Happens. Happens. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I've got to. Re- you got to respect that, uh, like that level of like follow through. Yeah. So, like okay, I'm gonna ho- we're gonna hold you to these principles. Yeah. But women being women, and and you know, the world being the way it is today, there are they will always find a loophole. Yeah. For find sure. a way around it. Yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah. That's one thing I can appreciate about about Islam and its conservative values. I've you know spent time some time in Egypt, some time in Qatar, and you know, a lot of the women they're fully covered from head to toe and. You know they present themselves as very conservative and yeah. and it's attractive to me like i look at that and I'm, I'm like wow that's amazing because when you get home you can take off that fucking burger and rip <laughs> it off and just <laughs> go crazy i don't know i think one, one day i would have to experience that for myself um but <laughs> while we're talking about religion and uh you touched on it a little bit earlier like i wanted to get your perspective on this you you seem like a strong man. You know who you are. Like you 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 seem set in your identity, your principles. How do you? What's your relationship with God and spirituality? I didn't. I don't think I knew Jesus Christ at all um, until recently. I've started to pray, digest more of the Bible, learn more about the Bible, learn more about uh, you know, the teachings of, of Christianity and expose myself to I guess teachers or as many teachings as I could possibly get. put myself in, in in places where you know I feel like there is a strong Christian presence yeah I'm a big fan of going into church I'm a big fan of you know every time I go into a cathedral here in Spain for example I always I'll light a candle and I'll pray I'm not Catholic but I will I'm not a part of any particular church or anything like that yeah again I'm I'm a, I'm a complete newbie to the subject, so right. I'm just trying to learn as much as I possibly can about it. Because I, I like to be, I like to have an informed opinion on things, not just an opinion. Right. right. You, you don't believe in faith? Uh, I do absolutely believe in faith. I don't think I have faith yet. Okay. Purely because I want, I'm in a situation where I want to have faith. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about like, like God and spirituality is like when you are ready for it, you want it, you find it. Yeah, 100%. I think so. Yeah. I had a very, I'll tell you about this very interesting experience I had. And in fact, I sh- I'm not wearing them right now, but I have, a, I have some um, prayer beads that I got off uh, an Irish man when I went to England, sorry, when I went to Ireland with my father re- very recently. We stopped off. We were just driving around the neighborhood, around the countryside, whatever, and looking for things to see at a particular plane. And we came across St. Patrick's Well, one of the many wells that he, that he you know, used to do baptisms in. The oh. St. Patrick, okay. the patron saint of Ireland. Right. Uh, he, used to, he would come to these, these natural springs where they used to do pagan rituals and when he converted the pagans to, to Catholicism he would baptize them in the spring. Oh. And this, this one in particular was still there. And it has the old, the old church walls are still there. It's all bricked up. It's, it's you know, kind of in a ruined state now but it's, you can still see where the church was, where the altar was. Uh, and the spring is all still there. And this is where St. Patrick literally you know, came and blessed people and baptized people and everything. And I, I pulled in there with my father and this old Irish man was there and he was carrying, he had to, descend down this sort of spiral staircase to get to the well. And this man was walking up the hill with these two jugs of water. I'm like, what are you doing there, mate? And he's like, oh, I, this, is, this is my drinking water. I, this is a natural spring. It's the healthiest, cleanest water we have in the neighborhood. So I fill up like several jugs of water and that's my drinking water for the week. And he comes there every week and does it. Wow. And I think the man, must, he must've been a priest. He must've been a priest. He had these prayer beads on his wrist. And as we, we walked down there to the well with him, he just told us all about the history of the well about the history of Catholicism in that region and everything yeah. like that. And then he took the beads off of his wrist and gave them to me. These, these Catholic prayer beads. And I was like, what? I'm like, I can't take this. He's like, no, 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 I insist you take these right now. I feel like these are meant to be with you right now. Wow. Yeah, and I wore them. I've been, I've worn them every day. I'm not wearing them right now, but I've worn them every day since. Really? Yeah, that was, 
very, I, I, I would, I was opening my mind to Christianity and I wanted to be Christian. I wanted to learn more about Christianity and learn about my background and my faith and my heritage as, as a, you know, Europe, ethnically European man. And, uh, you know, that experience was very interesting. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 you know, it's, it's amazing how God introduces certain things into your life, like when you're ready for it, you know? Yeah. So like, like for me, I was, I was raised in a Christian household, um, but our, our church experience was a little bit different from, I think, Eastern European churches. Uh, we, we were, I went to a Baptist church where it was more like for me it was more theatrical, so it didn't really feel real. Like a Southern Baptist one. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like that that sort of theme, that sort of vibe. Um, but I believe that God, and I appreciate that experience because it allowed me to to believe and have faith in a higher power. And then as I got older, I didn't so much uh, go into the church anymore. I had to find God my, my, on my own. Hmm. So I, I started like reading different. Uh, books on wisdom, uh, people like Manly P. Hall, um, Walter Russell, like th these guys are like esoteric geniuses because they look at the universe in such a, th through the lens of of someone who kind of sees God in everything. Like mm. if, if you look at like the Fibonacci sequence, for example, it's repeated all throughout the universe. That is, is God to me. That's God leaving, leaving clues. Like I, I've arranged this universe in a way where if you look, you can see it, you know? And, and you look at the laws of the universe, you have the law of gender, everything is male and female, you know? Uh, the law of uh, as above, so below. And all these different laws that if you, if you study them, you can, kinda, you can kinda see that everything is connected. There's, 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 you're not different from me. Like, we're connected in a, in a way. And, every, and, and when you, like, I meditate on that a lot. So that allows me to go deep, like kinda within myself where I don't really have a fear of death. I think it's more of a transformation at that point. Like you just transform into something else. Your energy is still alive, but you, you just leave your body. And uh, it allows me to live like a very, uh, not a fulfilling life, but a, a life where I'm, I'm content. Hmm. And I can look at things in, in a different way. Yeah. So I, I definitely encourage you like to keep going, man. Keep going. It's going to be a beautiful thing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not stopping anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for me, it, for me, my the place I'm at right now is sort of, I guess, digesting the gospels, learning more about the learning more about the gospels, learning more and and kind of learning more about the different denominations and what's like. There seems to be so much to me as an as a guy who was raised completely agnostic, right? Yeah. I had no faith growing up at all. I've only come into it, you know, in the last like few years. Same with family as well. Yep, completely agnostic. Yeah. Um, Technically, I'm Methodist. I think technically, because my parents are Methodist. Yeah. Uh, never baptized or anything like that. But the idea of all these different denominations, like you know, all of them agree that you know Christ is King and, and you know he's he is the Son of God. But they all bicker and fight and disagree about all kinds of min little minutia. Yeah. And I'm like, it's, to me, it just seems like you're focusing on the wrong thing. Yeah. Why are you focusing? Why are you all focusing on the things that separate you rather than? And this is a, as a complete newbie and a novice to this, so everyone feel free to rip me to shreds about my opinion. But yeah. <laughs> what do I know what I'm talking about? But it seems like why would you focus on the minutiae that separates you rather than not just focus on the thing you all believe in yeah. together? You know, uh, it, and, it, and in, in America in particular, there's like so many different Protestant denominations. It's, cr it's, it's hard to keep track of. I don't understand it. And understanding like what is the difference between all these things. Yeah. Uh, a very, very good resource for this is um, uh, Redeemed Zuma is a YouTube channel. He has a very, very good video breaking down all the different denominations and where they broke off and, and what they mean and what they st stood for initially. Yeah. Uh, I, but these days, I don't really think there's that much difference between them all, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I don't think there really is. Yeah, that's, that's well, so I've been looking into Islam, as you know, I'm a Muslim now, and, and uh, one thing that I appreciate about Islam is that it's, it's only two sects. And, and, it's, and even in the difference, there is no, there's no real difference. They still pray the same way, they still read the same book. Right. And, and there's, there's really nothing different. And interestingly enough, I talked to somebody who said that the government, obviously is always the government, they, they radicalized certain imams, like the Muslim uh, preachers, to start like having female leaders. <laughs> and like gay leaders and gay mosques now. Good, so. good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't think you're gonna have we'll much, see how uh, that much success. Turns out. <laughs> yeah, that's my, that is my um, problem with certain denominations in Christianity is one, you shouldn't let women preach. It's clear, that's very clear in the Bible. Yeah. And two, you shouldn't 
let gays and homosexuals preach. Yep, you're getting canceled. You're getting canceled, bro. I mean, I'm just reading, just, just literally what's written in the Bible. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> like, Cancel the Bible. Well, can't you try, can, try canceling the Bible. Right. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, yeah. So I and I, you know, people say that Christianity is is you know weak and dying these days. I've heard people say that. Uh, there's certain elements of Christianity that I, I do not see as, as weak at all. I think the Eastern Orthodox Church is incredibly strong. Really? Incredibly, their faith is incredibly strong. Uh, I like what I see when I, when I see, you know, the Eastern Orthodox, when I see Christians who are Eastern Orthodox, they're badasses. They're always very masculine men. So I like the appeal of that. What, but, is, what well, are some we'll, of the rituals we'll that they do? Don't know, and this, oh. this, and this is part of this. I don't know any of this. Yeah, okay. So you know, again, this is part of my learning journey. Here. Yeah. I've got no clue. It's it's like it's like a thousand piece puzzle, and it's all just white. Yeah, you know, there's no defining points on it. It's, it's this is what it feels like to me trying to decipher and learn all this stuff. I don't even know where to begin. Yeah. there's so much to to learn to kind of guide me through it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm getting advice from people, from different people I follow on Twitter and things about where to start. Start with the gospel. Start with that stuff. Don't, don't overcomplicate it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you ever look at the the lost books of the Bible, like the Book of Thomas? I've heard about that. I've heard the, you know, the, the Gospels of, of Mary, yep. for example, um, Gospel of Judas, things like this. Yeah. Uh, I've not read. You, you I, I, I've heard of them. I don't. Do you I'm, do you want to like read it to those as well? Yeah. I, I mean, like, when I when I take an interest in a topic, I go full full autist. So I. <laughs> I <laughs> I will probably dissect anything and everything I can on, yeah. on this topic. Uh, Tristan actually recommended a book called uh, The Great Schism, which is not even a very big book, but it talks about the schism where Catholicism and Eastern, Eastern Orthodoxy bra branched apart from each other. Uh, yeah, things like the Council of Nicaea and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I think the history of the church is very, very interesting because it's, it's basically intimately tied to the history of, the, of Europe as a whole, right? Yeah. Europe was... Christianity, right? Right. And then and both Western and Eastern Europe, and that's, it's a very, the history of it all is so fascinating. That's part of what is really driving my, my enthusiasm and interest in this, because I'm very into history, as you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I'm full of fun tidbits. Yeah. If you take, I'm a great tour guide. I think that's very cool, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's, I find it so interesting to learn all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it sound, it's it's bad, but in doing so, it kind of shakes my faith. Every time I learn a little bit more about the history of, of Christianity and the church and stuff, it shakes my faith a bit. But I think I need to do that. I think I need to go through that so I can reconcile it all. Well, how, how does it shake your faith? Just because I see humans like interfering with, like trying to pretend like this is the word of God, but it's really just humans. Yeah. You know, like the, like as an example, um, a good another another interesting book I've written read which is called um, ah oh, shit Rollo recommended it it's in my it's in my uh, Audible right now dang it yeah. sorry I, I don't want to misquote no, go ahead, go ahead. I don't want to misquote this because it's uh, yeah. it's a it's about God and wars or something like that um, it's better be in here dang it the crux of the book. Alpha God, that's the book. Okay. The book's called Alpha God. But there's a part in, in Alpha God where it, where it talks about like a few different popes who had like mistresses and, you know, uh, illegitimate kids and stuff when they're not supposed to be having wives and things like this. And um and you, you, you can't help I can't I can't at least help but, you know, see constant examples of hypocrisy throughout the history of churches in particular. Uh, not necessarily Christianity or Christians, but churches and, and this, the power structures of it, yeah. which make which make me question those power structures to begin with. Right? Is this the like how much of modern church teachings is the word of God versus like the laws of man, right? Or the practices of man? Yeah. How much is, how, how and how much of that have people conflated? Right? How much of that have modern Christians taken as verbatim, like as God's law? When it's not really God's law, it's just it's more you know just the practice and culture of those humans at that particular time. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily God didn't necessarily instruct you to do exactly this. Yeah. You know? So I think. Yeah, I think I just need to read the Bible, interpret it for myself, and then I'll be able to come at these things with a with a far better understanding of it. Yeah, I mean, in in all powerful you know structures or institutions, you have 
you have to as, as an individual when you're approaching the topic of, of religion you have to separate the institution of religion from the religion itself i believe you have to study the books and not look at the people as yeah. representation of the book yeah and then that's how you are able to bypass that but i think a lot of people get caught up especially like you know a lot of atheists or, or agnostics they might say oh well like look at how these christians live or how these muslims live like, you can't be a muslim if you, you know, islam has to be bad because you know muslims ran into the world trade center it's like like come on like it's, that's not the way the way these things work yeah um, but it's getting a little late, man. I just want, I want to, you know, the last topic I want to touch on. You, you got these amazing supplements coming out. Like, let's t- tell the audience what you have coming out, why they should get it, how it's going to change their lives. Well, we've got four in our lineup right now. Uh, the brand is called Clubhouse Supplements. That's the brand uh, umbrella. Under Clubhouse which, Supplements. Yeah, that's the brand cool. we, we've, I've, we and my partners come up with. And basically everything we crank out is a combination of basically supplement stacks I used to take when I was working in the adult film industry for a very for very specific purposes so okay. the one I have one supplement which is called wood which is designed to give you wood basically uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's actually incredibly it's got it's kind of a uh, a heart health a, a secret heart health pill actually it's like it's designed to clear out your arteries so I'm gonna so dudes who come to me and they're like oh, I've got boner problems okay I give them this stack or I give them the supplement not only are they getting stronger erections, but they're actually reducing their risk of heart attack <laughs> massively. Great. Great. <laughs> so we clean out your arteries, we give you stronger nitric oxide production. All these things help to produce the erection in the first place. So right. wood is our bonus supplement. We have fire, which is our sex drive supplement. This is actually literally what I would take the day before a scene, like to get myself fired up on all cylinders. So I was like raring to go all the time. If you're having sex constantly every day for a living, sex drive is something you need to manage. Yeah. Uh, and I take my background being a chemist and understanding human biology and hormones quite seriously right. in the way that we formulate these supplements. So fire, for example, is designed to decrease prolactin in the male brain. Prolactin not only causes that drowsy, sleepy feeling after your orgasm, that's, the, that's what you get, that's that brain dump you get. That's caused by prolactin. High levels of prolactin also make you more feminine. They, they elicit female feminine uh, characteristics in men. So like, like literally like man boobs and moodiness. This is all, a lot of this comes down to prolactin as well. People wow. think it's estrogen, but it's a yeah. combination of both. So we reduce that, fires up the sex drive, amps up the sex drive, and it also allows you to reduce what's called the refractory period, which is the time it takes to recover between orgasms. Oh, okay. So we've got guys who've gone from, you know, taking, it takes them 30 minutes or an hour to taking like five minutes yeah. to pop, a, to go like, Finish five minutes, they're rock hard, ready to go again. Before it was one hour. It's a massive difference. Yeah. And that's all because of, by manipulating hormonal chemistry in the brain in a healthy way, safe way, totally safe. There's no negative side effects to this. There's only positive ones. So there's <laughs> yeah. no synthetic like supplements? No, this is all natural stuff. Wow. Everything, everything we put in this is, is herbal. Like we're talking about vitamins, we're talking about minerals, we're talking about herbs. That's all we use. We don't, we're not using any pharmaceutical drugs here. These are all, these are what you would call a nutraceutical. So yep. it's all natural substances. Yep. Yeah, all healthy, we all FDA approved GMP certified facilities. We quality test all of our stuff, um, like for purity, for any contaminants. If the contaminants don't, if we have any traces of contaminants in, our, in any of the ingredients, we scrap the batch and do a new one. Wow. So we try to keep things as, as crisp and as clean as we possibly can. Uh, the other two we've got out right now, we have Bold, which is our, uh, performance anxiety reducing supplements so basically guys who have boner problems they think they have like they think their dick's not working right what is really happening is your mind fucking yourself if you've as a perfect example of how to figure out if you have performance anxiety if you get morning wood but with that woman it's not rising to the occasion your dick's working fine yeah it's your brain that's fucking you so what we do is we manipulate the dht levels in guys so we increase DHT, dihydroxytestosterone, right? It's actually 10 times more androgenic than testosterone itself. And it's actually responsible for all the male characteristics that guys associate with testosterone. They think, oh, higher testosterone means chiseled jawline, stronger hair, like, you know, more facial hair, uh, more assertiveness, more confidence. That is true, but DHT does that 10 times as much. Right, okay. So, and people often associate DHT with uh, male pattern baldness and bald head. It's a, it can amplify things. If you have all, you have to have a certain degree of toxicity and um, a few other things for the DHT to amplify the baldness in the first place. So that's a common misconception people have. So bold amplifies the DHT, gives you more confidence, 
and gives you more stress tolerance. Guys with high, naturally high DHT are guys who are very, very like, capable of tolerating high stress situations. So think fighters, firefighters, soldiers, CEOs. These are all, I guarantee you take a blood test of any guy in a, in a high stress, a high performance guy in a stressful situation, he has high levels of DHT. Wow. Yeah. Um, so you can, and you can adjust this stuff. So, so even like, aside from sex, you can take the supplement and, and just be able to handle stress better. Yeah. Okay. Precisely. That sounds great. Precisely, yeah. <laughs> so all, the, like, all of these things have added bonuses. So like I said, the, the bonus supplement will help you with your heart health. You're less likely to get a heart attack. The sex drive supplement will actually also give you more motivation. You'll be more driven because we raise your dopamine levels. Wow. We drop your prolactin, we raise your dopamine, you have more motivation and drive in general, right? Bold, we amp up your DHT, you reduce your performance anxiety, but you, in the real world, you're also able, more able to handle stress. The last one we have right now is STUD, which is our premature ejaculation supplement. So we prevent premature ejaculation by calming your brain down. And what percentage of men uh, deal with premature ejaculation? I think it's something like 30%, or, or slightly other above, depending upon the age bracket. Okay. Um, it tends to be a lot more prevalent with older guys now than younger guys. Um, I think that's just because of habitual porn use. Okay. But it's still, it's still very, very common. Um, Yes, and, and premature ejaculation isn't like a set number of minutes. It's just your ability to control yourself. Do right. you, it's not like, don't think of it like, oh, if I reach the four minute mark, I don't have premature ejaculation. Right? Right. It's like, did I want to come yet? Yeah. If the answer was no, then it's, it's, a, it's an instance of premature ejaculation. If you don't have the con ability to control it, if you get too excited then, and you lose control, then as, I will deem that premature ejaculation. Okay. So we, we tackle this by increasing the GABA in your brain which is a calming neurotransmitter, and we reduce the glutamate in your brain. And that is a excitatory neurotransmitter that leads you to be overexcited and lose control. Here's a fun fact. Yeah. Most men are consuming way too much, without even knowing it, they're consuming excess amounts of glutamate in the form of MSG. MSG, yes. monosodium glutamate. In all the fucking foods these It's days. in fucking everything. Yep. It's in everything packaged pre-prepared or at a restaurant, you are consuming MSG. And we've been consuming this our whole life. So guys, like everything else about their body will be perfectly fine. They're super fit, they're healthy, they're, they're confident, but then they get in the bedroom and they bust in two minutes. Like, why the fuck am I coming so quickly? I can't control this. And that's because of the cup of noodles that Adam ate? They've been, they've been having two minute noodles their whole life. <laughs> yeah. Or eating Cheetos. Yeah. And it's just, and it, it compounds. It just, it just stacks in their brain. So we've got, when we, with our supplement, we cut, we help the body get rid of that glutamate and help increase the GABA in their brain. So we can eventually reset their brain back to a very calm, confident state where they can actually control themselves and, and actually have fulfilling sex, yeah. enjoy sex for a change. Rather than, because the, the experience most guys have when they have premature ejaculation is one of like, oh shit, I hope I don't come, oh, no. They, they, they're not enjoying it. Right, right. <laughs> I want guys to actually chill and fucking have a good time. <laughs> I've been there, bro. <laughs> right, who wants to enjoy, who wants yeah. that? It's not a fun experience, yeah. right? So we give guys the ability to control their body again, which is kind of our ultimate goal, is like yeah. optimizing your performance and giving you the ability to control every aspect of your body like that. Yeah, yeah. so those are the... Those are the four we have right now. We've got, we've got three, four more coming out. We'll probably crank those out by the end of the year. Okay. That's the, that's the plan right now. So sweet. Yeah. So, so listen guys, if you guys want those supplements, you should be able to get them with a link in this description because Sterling's going to provide that link. Yep. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking forward to that. Hey, listen, Sterling, you are one of the guys that are truly changing uh, for the better men's health, men's intimacy, and for women as well, <laughs> by default. Yeah. So I want to say thank you, brother, for, for helping me personally, and thank you for the work that you're doing. It's great work. This is important work. This is work you should feel proud of. Thank you. Uh, I don't think your talents were wasted in the porn industry. You, you <laughs> fucking learned a lot. Your talents were not wasted when you, uh, were, when you got your chemistry degree. You're implementing that right now. So I think you're doing a fantastic job, brother. Thank you so much. You should man. keep it up. Appreciate you. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs>